Welcome. Welcome to the Brooklyn Rails 535th New Social Environment. I'm Carolyn, the program's associate here at the Rail, and I have the real pleasure and privilege of being your MC today for a conversation featuring Troy Montes Michi with Zoe Hopkins and Andrea Anderson. We're thrilled to welcome poet Jalen Strong here to close today's program. Um, and we'd like to thank Rivers Institute for Contemporary Thought and Art, uh, California African American Museum and Company Gallery for their support today. Before we get started, the Brooklyn Rail acknowledges Black Lives Matter and that here in New York, we are on Lenape Hoking, the unceded land and waters of the Wappinger, Canarsie, Muncie, and Lenny Lenape people of the Delaware Nation and Shinnecock Indian Nation. We encourage you to check the chat for a living document of resources and actions. Over the past 22 years, the Brooklyn Rail has undertaken a miraculous journey, bringing together in a single monthly publication, art, music, dance, film, theater, and literature, along with thoughtful social and political meditations. As a small nonprofit, we need your support. Your contribution will directly support our writers, guest artists, production staff, and operations here at the Rail. Please check the chat for more information and links to donate. And now to introduce today's guests and hosts, Referencing a rule of camouflage known as disruptive patterning, which works by breaking up the outlines of an object with a strongly contrasting pattern, Troy Montes Michi investigates the ways in which bodies of marginalized communities are frequently erased and fetishized. His work has recently been exhibited at the Institute for Contemporary Art at Richmond, the MAC Belfast, and many other institutions. Montes Michi is a lecturer in the visual arts program at Princeton University. Writer and curator Andrea Anderson serves as the founding director and chief curator of Rivers Institute for Contemporary Art and Thought, a nonprofit institute for research, publishing, and exhibitions committing to art informed by diasporic experience. She has organized several exhibitions, co edits a series of artists' books with Siglio Press, and also recently co edited, San co -edited Sanford Biggers' Code Switch. Writer Zoe Hopkins studies art history and African American studies at Harvard University. Her writing has appeared in Hyperallergic, The Brooklyn Rail, and White Hot Magazine of Contemporary Art. And with that, I will turn it over to you, Zoe and Andrea. Thank you, Carolyn, for that introduction. Um, I'm thrilled to be in conversation with you, Troy, and with you, Andrea. So glad to all be here together. Thank you for the introduction and really happy to spend this time with um, Andrea and Zoe. It really means the world to be here again. Um, and Troy, of course, congratulations on two fabulous shows, um, one in New York at Company Gallery and one in, um, in California at the California African American um, Arts Museum. Um, I want to begin by um, framing this with an act of transparency, which is to say that I have not yet been able to see your show at CAAM, um, but I have had the privilege of seeing your show at Company um, and just want to encourage any and all New Yorkers in the room um, to go out and see the show, which I believe was extended until April 23rd. Is that right, Troy? Um, yes. Yeah, so it's just a fabulous collection of, of works on view there. Um, and so if you have the ability to do so, um, I certainly encourage you to, to go and visit. Um, I suppose we can take it away with the first question, unless there are any objections. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Um, so, so from my end, um, something that I noticed at the company show is you have this really delightful use of titles um, and a real attention to and, and, and careful regard for language in your work. Um, just to give a, a couple of examples of some of the titles that I, I found um, the most spectacular. Um, Sometimes I only see the other river on your face. Or was the beautiful woman in the mirror of the water you or me? Um, I just love the poesis of these titles. Um, the, they're, they're all so absolutely musical and rhapsodic. Um, and I was wondering if you could speak to what informed these titles. Um, how you regard the relationship between the art you make and poetry um, and, and kind of how you arrived at them. Um, I'm just, I, I would love to hear from you um, about your, your process in constructing a title. 
Um, I mean, I've been asked about titles before, and I kind of, I'm ready this time <laughs> for the question. Um, but kind of simultaneously, while I'm collecting different image archives, I also collect different um, kind of pieces of text. So I'm an avid reader. And a lot of times, I, I like reading the old school way. I like writing in my books and underlining things. Um, so oftentimes, the, the things that I'm reading inform the titles. And that's kind of across the board in terms of most of my work, whether it's um, from like Ellison to Roxane Gay to Gloria Anzaldúa. Um, a lot of times, too, if I'm watching a movie and there's just a certain phrase that sounds really poetic or sticks with me, I'll write it down. Um, but for Dishwater Holds No Images, I guess it was two, um, two different writers I was thinking about. So um, Cherry Moriaga wrote this really nice book. Um, it's, well, it's a two act play called Giving Up the Ghost. And it takes, I guess there's three characters, but what I enjoyed about the book is that two, two of the characters are the same person, but one is in the past and one is in, in the present. And the present character is a Pachuca. So there are so many beautiful, um, I guess, um, sentences in that play that kind of just stuck out to me. And it related a lot to how I was thinking about growing up on the border. Mm -hmm. um, Troy, I might uh, pick up here with, ending on the sentence border, um, but to bring our attention actually to a title of a work um, that is not yours, um, uh, but does seem to hang in both of these shows. <laughs> um, and that's a work from 1933 by Frida Kahlo, My Dress Hangs There. Um, you and I have talked about uh, this work and you have talked about it with, you know, in past interviews and, and conversations before, but, you know, there's, there are both formal ways that this show, this work shows up in your practice and also um, psychogeographic ways and, and medium based. I wish, wonder if you could just talk a little bit about how the history of this work for you um, and then the way that you continue to think through it. Yeah. Um... I guess growing up so close to the border, my biggest influences were the Mexican muralists. I really enjoyed the way that they used figuration. I enjoyed kind of the medium of the mural as something that could be shown to the public. They didn't need access to see the work in like a private institution. But ultimately my favorite artist was Frida Kahlo because her work just felt a little bit more raw and gritty. And I mean, we all kind of know like how amazing Frida Kahlo is, but this, this particular painting I was struck by because at the time I was in an intro to painting class and I had noticed that the, the bottom portion of the painting is collaged, there's collaged elements of different newspaper clippings. And that's kind of the first time I was kind of like, oh, I'm allowed to do that in a painting because my, my training was pretty formal. And so from there, I, I had first started using um, that, the magazine Physique Pictorial, and I'd cut out the, the figures and then glue them into my oil paintings. And I, I you know, I, I want to continue here just a little bit in terms of the way that it still gives shape, um, or, or at least more recently, it has given shape um, to some of the ways that you have installed your work um, and, you know, the even the title of this conversation, Hung Out to Dry, which is also the title of a, a work of yours from 2019. But there are suspension lines and um, folding drying racks that figure in both shows that we're here to talk about today. Um, and I, you know, whenever, when I, when we were installing, I'll sort of give a little bit of back end information. We were installing two, um, uh, two garments that were going to be suspended in space um, in California. And we were struggling a little bit with how to orient the line. There was a, a cord that was going to be attached from corner to corner. Um, and then you introduced a second line. And, you know, for the, this may be uh, visible in some of the installation shots um, from the cam show that if we want to take a look at those. But it really was this moment of, of resolution in the show when we saw two lines um, 
actually figuring in space. Um, and I think, and, and if there's a, maybe some of, some of the works that I am envious of, um, if I can say that from the company show are, are the drying racks that you introduced in this, in this batch, this sort of way that they hold space. And it's really hard not to also recognize those lines and those racks as, as a kind of drawing in space, um, that these are, that these are lines. I mean, when you introduced that second line and, and at CAM, it was like, oh, I see, uh, now, now we can hang these other works. And so it was not just a kind of armature, it was actually its own kind of drawing. And I, so, you know, this certainly comes through from Kahlo and, and obviously there's lots of allegory that we can play with here, but I'd love for to, you know, if you have any comments about, about drawing um, from a sculptural perspective. Yeah, I mean, I think everything you said is pretty spot on. Um, I guess one, one thing I remember about that Frida Kahlo painting is she painted it with the kind of frustration of city life, living in New York City, kind of missing Mexico and the terrain um, and the climate. And I guess when I think about that painting, it ultimately kind of holds this place as like a, a type of estranged form. And estrangement is something that I think about often in my artwork, um, specifically the estrangement of body or identity. Um, and I guess with all these different facets of collage or sculpture, drawing and painting, drawing is always kind of at the center for me. That's kind of where I first kind of found myself as a child, um, just kind of drawing everything that I don't, mainly people, I would get in trouble for drawing and not doing <laughs> close um, classwork and also talking too much. But um, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I think with the lines, I, and I knew at the cam show that that space needed something else. Mm -hmm. And it felt really important to create that second line, not only as a place for the work to continue with the company show, but also to show a moment of convergence. Because so, so often in my work, I'm thinking about outline, right, or contour. And that has such a history in terms of print media, um, thinking about etching and how like shading and value was applied. Um, but also just kind of, I don't know, it's almost like this obsession with the, um, the contours of our own body and what, what that means when our bodies are kind of drawn up against a background in a photograph. Mm -hmm. So drawing is kind of always present. I love that so much. Um, and it's reminding me of our converse, our brief conversation at company, um, sort of impromptu in the gallery. Um, and you mentioned to me that um, a lot of your materials pay homage to um, your love for drawing. And so you're using this kind of suite of ink, graphite, Conte, grease pencil. Um, and so I was wondering if you could speak to how those are interacting with um, the other materials that define your work, um, this real um, engagement with um, clothing and patterns um, and, and also archival materials, newspapers. Um, how do you see those, those materials acting in conversation with one another? What's the dialogue between them? I mean, it, it kind of takes a, quite a while to collect a lot of them. Um, throughout both of the shows, uh, I guess what's well, a little bit different with the company show, but with the cam show to see works that I've made since 2014 till I believe it was in like 2020. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of those were compiled from archived erotic magazines. And something that I enjoy about magazines that are printed in the 70s and 80s is that there's such, um, there's such a depth in the ink on the page. The, the paper is a little bit sturdier. Um, I mean, these pages kind of can withhold a lot because I'm sewing onto them, I'm drawing over them. And it's just kind of, um, I don't know, there, there's something with that kind of offset print that I really enjoy. And also moments where the registration isn't completely perfect. So you kind of see this sliver of like, like the cyan or like the CMYK. Um, I'm trying to think of other materials. What else do I collect? With, with the grease pencils and um, I'm trying to think of the other ones. With the grease pencils, I'm kind of into this old, old school way of the way that like newspapers would do cropping um, on photographs. So they'd kind of use the grease pencil to 
push things in the background or to bring them forward or to add a border. And that's kind of my interest in using them. And they also can withstand a lot. So I am using a lot of different mediums to kind of allow me to continue working um, in multiple layers. Um, and it's, it's kind of funny, like during this time in, in the pandemic, I, I started to realize how much of my work is still similar to what I'm doing as a kid. So I'll, I'll, another thing I would do as a child, I, I, was always, I would always draw on newspapers um, and I would change the people in the papers into other people. And that was just kind of like this funny notion where I was like, oh my God, I went to grad school to like go back to something <laughs> that I was doing at like 10. Um, but yeah, like photocopiers and um, yeah, drawing on newspapers. Uh, on the topic of, of archives, I wanted, you know, in, in our show, we drew from your own archive uh, and, and your collection over time. Um, uh, of sewing patterns. And just recently, I'm, I, I should say that we are very excited here in New Orleans, um, together with Amistad Research Center, uh, we'll be welcoming Troy as a research resident in New Orleans um, in less than a month's time, I think, <laughs> right? Yeah, I think so. Um, and our my colleague, Jade Flint, who works uh, together with Amistad and Rivers, uh, was has been doing some preliminary digging on behalf of Troy. So we kind of like to dig in the archive before you get here. And, and she came upon um, this really great, I don't even know if she's shown it to you yet, but this sewing exercise um, that was uh, from a domestic arts cl class at Dillard um, at mid-century. And um, just has kind of different stitching patterns. And so just first to say that it's it's a different thing to look in an archive on your behalf, because I, I think you know we're sort of stepping back and and to your use your word estranging, like, well, what what is an archive? What what is valuable in this archive from a different vantage point? Um, but when she found that it reminded me of some of uh, of the our research early on in the book and and my learning a little bit more about Hannah Hoch's work as a um, when she was working uh, in uh, the handy handiwork pattern department um, at Ulstein Verlag during the war. And all of this um, makes me want to ask you and invite you to talk a little bit more specifically and give a little bit of context for everyone listening in about your relationship to the Zoot Suit, but also this this really sensitive space, I think, between collage and garments and war, um, which feel inextricable in your practice? It, it mainly came about, so bef before 2016, I was working primarily with just kind of collaging um, with the, the men's erotic magazines mm -hmm. and kind of just figuring out a way that I could come back to this language of painting. Um, so when, when that presidential election started, I kind of just felt like that was the moment that I had to do something to talk about El Paso and growing up there. And for years, I, I didn't know how to do it. And um, I was talking with my, my father about the, the zoot suit and that kind of sparked this moment in history because everybody in El Paso is aware of the zoot suit. Like we see people wearing them for quinceaneras, like we would ha often have to watch zoot suit in class uh, al along with stand and deliver like on those kind of days. Um, <laughs> but I never really focused on it. So once, once I started to research it more, I was super excited that I had kind of um, not stumbled upon, but kind of been like revisited this past that I had lived amongst. So El Paso is kind of the origin for Pachuco culture um, and also the suit it's like the first garment worn um, first American suit worn predominantly by men of color it was a garment that was crit, um, criminalized um, in the race riots and the zoot suit riots and um, that kind of started my first kind of excursion into clothing and originally I thought that I could just buy vintage zoot suits and cut them up and then because of the riots, I realized that these are really hard to find. <laughs> like there is a suit I think that was purchased by LACMA from New Jersey. I think they bought it at an estate sale for like $40 and it ended up being um, an authentic zoot suit and it ended up selling for like 80,000 or something like that. So it's, it's very hard to find kind of one that's intact. Um, but the more I started to work with patterns and clothing, I started to realize that clothing 
in and of itself is almost like a collage that you kind of piece together. Mm -hmm. And I, I think also to that end, there's so much in your work about um, fashion as as performance um, and as uh, you know, self fashioning as a mode of um, we we throw this term around so so often. Um, but self fashioning as as a kind of mode of performance. Um, and I think you know, in both shows um, that we're talking about today. Um, there's this also this emphasis on race and gender um, as categories that are performed as well um, and that are that are mutable rather than fixed um, that are constantly changing based on the way um, the way in which people self fashion um, and so I'm I'm wondering um, you know part of the really amazing gesture that you're making um, in the company show is you have kind of um, placed these garments that often index masculinity um, and a kind of um, spirit of, you know, rebellion. Um, you have placed these garments um, onto um, the bodies of women, um, and you have also situated them within this kind of historical context of the fashion catalog, right, which we imagine as this space of kind of like um, uh, untouched, um, you know, ideal Americana. Um, and, and I'm wondering if you could kind of speak to how you came upon some of these materials, um, specifically the fashion catalogs um, and the patterns that you're using. Where did you encounter them? Um, how did you decide which you wanted to use? Um, how, how did you kind of develop this, this language? Um, I, I find it really, really particular. I, I haven't really found fashion catalogs in art so much. Um, so I'd just love to kind of hear about your your journey with with these objects in particular. Yeah, I mean, um, like where to start? So mm -hmm. the, I guess I could, I feel like I'm, I keep forgetting to answer parts of, of questions that you were asking me. <laughs> Sorry, that uh, was a very long-winded one as well. <laughs> the, my interest in the magazine, I think first kind of sparked um, again, and childhood going into like the neighborhood um, Walgreens, right? And that was kind of the first moment that I saw something, it, it was a men's workout magazine, but it was it was clearly homoerotic. It was like, I don't know what was going, it was, I think it was called men's workout. And that was kind of the first moment that I had kind of uh, understood that my sexuality may be what others deem alternative in the community. Um, so that there is kind of this relationship to print media because that's how I experienced so much of my childhood as an older millennial, um, like buying certain music magazines or that was my way of kind of getting a pulse on culture and music and art, um, television as well. And with, the, with Dishwater Holds No Images, I really wanted to take a break from kind of the work that I've been doing for a while and think more about kind of um, the women in, in my community. So I was raised by kind of a group of really strong women and I wanted to do something for them because I realized that so many of my um, viewers may not realize that the suit was worn by both men and women. Um, and and I, I wasn't sure that they could realize that because so much of my figures were men, right? Um, so it, it took some time because I had to figure out how to work, work with that imagery because I, I, I couldn't use, I feel like um, pornography is already kind of really tense. So I, I didn't feel the right to kind of use images of women in that way to reclothe. And so I started to think about kind of just, uh, again, like growing up in, in um, a non-large city kind of mall culture, Sears, Montgomery Wards and thinking about how, how so much of um, my childhood was like, what do you want? Like look through the magazine, circle it, I'll go to the store, we'll like put it on layaway <laughs> type of thing. And um, it really just felt like that was kind of the way that I could try to amplify a garment that had kind of not really um, been given the, the proper exposure that Latina women were due because they were also wearing um, the garment. 
I mean, there was, there was also kind of like the short skirts and high heels, but they also were wearing um, the full suit. So I kind of wanted to, to do something to kind of um, like disrupt kind of this um, kind of circuit or feed that was kind of being given from the like dominantly white models, super skinny. Um, I mean, in a lot of these catalogs, they're kind of idealized visions, right, of what they think a consumer would want in their home or how, how the identity that they want to be if they have this garment or if they have this sofa or if they have these certain objects. There's, in talking about these two shows together, and, in, and I'm thinking a lot, you know, in our early conversations, you were a few years back thinking about how, to, how, how your practice might make room and foreground the women in your, in your life experience. And so there's a real, um, it's very exciting to be talking about these two shows together because it really follows a real arc in your practice um, from 2014 all the way um, to the show that's currently on view. And, you know, you have talked before about um, how you know what to do next or how you get from one place to another. And you've used the word intuition, right? That you, you kind of just fundamentally intuit and there's a kind of trust that you know where to go. And it's an intuition that I don't, you know, like that conversation came later, it came after the title Rock of Eye. But Rock of Eye is, is a kind of, um, you know, drawing in space based on intuition. It's not relying on, on maps. And yet, in the show, you know, the, by by amplifying and um, scanning and and scaling uh, some of these uh, sewing patterns, there's there's a kind of cartography that that evolved. And I, so this is we've never talked about this before, but I'm curious about the relationship for you between intuition and then like getting lost. I mean, if we're talking about a kind of wayfinding here, like go to the left, shake to the right, you know, cut here. Um, do you, are those, are they both at play for you? Um, how can you talk about those, those two seemingly opposing um, impulses? Mm. I mean, I still kind of feel like intuition is an ugly word in like art circles. <laughs> but, um... I, I like it, it's really affirming. <laughs> Whenever you say it, I'm like, ah. Oh. <laughs> Well, I mean, I think it's a very real thing for collage artists um, and even in like with poets, like there's something about trusting your gut and allowing that, that all these different observations are, I feel like my eyes are just recorders and that there may be something there visually in language that I may not have the words for yet. Um, and so I think it's important to develop intuition and when I think so much about my art education, I was like, I think grad school was the moment where I was like, oh, like intuition kind of, I, I didn't, I kind of lost my my center in that moment through all the, the critiques. Um, <laughs> oof, but it's, it's something that came back um, in my years later. And so kind of learning to trust that gut, but a, a lot of times it feels tense, right? Like I was really, nervous about the transition of the work, but I also knew that I had to do it because the, um, the project was asking for me to do it, which may sound kind of crazy, but um, I, I kind of feel like the work communicates to me in this like material language and it kind of informs the next thing. And with each, each body of work that I do, I'm just kind of like, I don't know, it's like, there's something that's not there yet. There's something that's missing. And then the next body of work happens and I'm like, ah, okay, that was the thing. And, and I, I kind of enjoy working that way because it still makes it exciting. I don't need to know all the answers, um, but a huge part of the intuition I think is fueled by all of the research. So it's almost like, um, not like I'm a character actor, but I want to really make sure mm -hmm. Like I'm reading, I read so many books on the history of the zoot suit and um, learning about like the American camouflage society and how artists really developed um, camouflage theory, uh, listening to zoot suit music um, from El Paso, Texas. So it's almost like I want to bring myself to this certain time, um, but then also think about place. So, so much of the the visual language in El Paso, it's, it's highly militarized, right? It's, it's the border, 
patrol. I grew up seeing camouflage every day with the presence of Fort Bliss, which I feel like is the largest military base in the country. Um, and I guess with what was the what was the relation from intuition to patterning? Well, I, I mean, I think when I when, when we were working on the project together, and when we first started working on the book, you know, there was um, a way in which we didn't know where we were going yet, which I, which was wonderful. Like we, you know, it was a really like, what are we going to do with these materials in a gorgeous and a very exciting way. But, yeah. but for me, that was also um, an experience of um, a happy experience of, of being lost for a while. And I do think that the experience, or I hope that the experience uh, for viewers when they walk into the galleries at CAM is also um, a sense of bewilderment in in the cartography of that space, right? That that the landscape goes on forever, right? Um, that you can't see the border, or you can't, you don't know where sky starts, or you know. And so there's a, it feels like a kind of opposition between, you know, that kind of clarity and affirmation of intuition and the bewilderment and the uncertainty of where you are in space. But I, my, my sense is that they are actually working in coordination in your practice. And so it's that sort of relationship that I was curious about. I mean, I think with that project, we were look, working on it for so long <laughs> in the pandemic years. And there was a lot of- Over and over. <laughs> oh my God. There was so many moments of feeling lost, but I don't know, it kind of just, I was so happy during the install to see that again, like if you just trust like this intuition that things will fall into place because at first I was like, okay, maybe it's a show of all new work. Maybe it's this, maybe it's that. And then I realized that I, I wanted to give the, the viewer a sense of what it felt like to be in one of the collages. Um, and that's why we discussed bringing in the clothing patterns on the floor and the, the book or that the catalog actually informed that show more than I realized because I never knew working on a book was so intense. <laughs> but what, working on that book, it really finalized things for me. And I was like, oh, like it was, it was drawing connections to my practice that I had not been privy to. And so from that, it was like, that was the template that then influenced the install um, because so much of it was driven by I don't know this, or I guess driven by fragmentation and the way that that book is set up to give the viewer a sense of how I work, all the different materials I collect, how they undergo many different histories before they're kind of encapsulated in the adhesive. Mm -hmm. um, and I was just really pleasantly surprised that it, everything just kind of came together. Yeah. All right, I really love the way um, you speak about kind of leaning into the unknown um, and bring that into conversation with, with research um, and with your very kind of rigorous historical methodology. Because um, so much of what you're doing is a kind of a storytelling that is negotiated with and through the archives. Um, and I know at least for me, um, when I work with archives, so much of it is intuitive and sometimes things will grab me and I'm not really sure why. I'll just have this moment where something, I don't know, something will seem to kind of like pierce me from within that yeah. box um, and, and I just can't let go of it. Um, and I'm wondering if you have similar experiences or um, if, if you have moments in, um, when you're working with archives that that grab you in that way, um, and and what is it that that makes you connect to a certain piece of archival material? Um, is is there a moment when you you know that this is something you would like to engage with in your work? Yeah, I, mean, I feel like you described it. It's it's that feeling that you get. Um, not that my process is like mystical or like alchemic, <laughs> but kind of right, like the that certain magazine page like as as I as I source them I kind of open them up take the staples out of them and then I automatically know like which which image is going to be something like I'll kind of go through them and I'm like that's going to be something I don't know what that is yet but I'll set it aside and then the others kind of become the the woven part of the works um same with objects like I'll just be 
walking and see see an object and I just feel like I need it and I don't necessarily know why um it's it's harder to do in New York City with like bad bugs and all of that <laughs> so I'm like well, I look crazy if I take this object um but in a lot of the the first work in 2016 I actually went to Texas and collected a lot of materials there um and that's something that I would see growing up just in the desert like a lot of people unfortunately throw um, garbage into the desert landscape but it, it does start to have its own certain kind of I don't know like patina as the sun kind of bleaches it out um, so kind of thinking of these like forgotten um, ready-mades that are I don't know kind of colored by the sun um, but yeah it's 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 kind of like I, kind of, I kind of like to think of it if anybody plays music because I, I play a little bit of music like you just get a moment where you know that you're going to write a song like you just feel it like I have to get to the guitar or I have to write right because you know that something is ready to um, unfold and then a, a lot of the other times it's not that easy it's a lot of <laughs> juxtaposing things and there's just like frustration yeah. right. right no but I love I love that your work is really this kind of like disruption of the conventional opposition between um, kind of historicism um, or research and then like play and accident, right? Because we have this like very rigorously defined idea of what it means to do work with archives um, and to be a historian, right? Yeah. And it's all it's all kind of like conceived around these notions of, um, you know, like method and, um, you know, process and going step to step. But um, so much of the things that I, I, I think make your work um, so special are, are in the kind of accidents and the intuition that Andrea described. Um, so I just wanted to, to highlight that. And as you're, as you're talking, Zoe, I'm also looking at the, at the image that's up right now. And this is um, from, from the company show. And so I, I should also say that Zoe and I were talking beforehand that we, you know, she didn't see the cam show, but I haven't seen, I haven't had the, the good fortune of seeing the company show. So we're, we're sort of each other's eyes for, for this conversation um, and filled in some stuff for each other. But um, I think um, when I have seen that, you know, this, this zipper work, um, there was one zipper work that that preceded or anticipated this one, which was at the momentary, um, a show that just closed. And you and I talked a lot about these works because they really, they seem to do a lot of, to do a new or, or clarified for me, um, something of the role of narrative uh, in your practice, or at least introduced for me. I'm not even sure I fully appreciated that sense of um, sequence or sequentiality um, as a logic. Um, but now, even in this conversation, when we, you know, start and we're talking about uh, Frida Kahlo's work and and allegory, and then we, you know, move through some of the histories, and then we arrive at this picture. I'm I'm just really overcome by this very persistent um, relationship to narrative and, and storytelling. Um, that might be a disrupted storytelling, but I, I, I'd love for you to talk a little bit about how you understand like narrative construction, because it seems like the way that you suture things is a, a development of, of story. Oof. I guess the, the narrative is non-linear. Non <laughs> even if the zipper pieces are yeah. um but it is very much like sometimes I feel like my mind is like a collage of different thoughts mm -hmm. and just trying to grab onto one um but the the zipper pieces were really exciting and that the first one that I made I really wanted to kind of be in, in dialogue with Rauschenberg like so much of my life people are like you're, you're like Rauschenberg but also I'm like okay <laughs> <laughs> um, when I saw this piece at, at his retrospective called Hiccups, I was just blown away because it, it, it was one that I'd never really encountered. So I thought it would be nice to think about the, the action of clothing, right? To, to button up a shirt or to, to zip up a zipper um, and what that could do with kind of the language of the work that I was presenting. Because even though I'm more of a studio-based artist, I feel like a lot of the work calls 
for a per performative gesture, right? Like the, um, the zoot suit had a function and that it was used for swing dancing. And that's why they needed the wider legs for to do kicks and swings. Um, and that kind of comes up in one of the pieces of the show called um, Nada se mueve como yo. So um, nothing moves like me. So I was thinking a lot about kind of these old school analog dance charts with like footsteps on how to do like the jitterbug and all of these different, um, um, what is it called, uh, dance, dance styles. Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know, did that kind of answer that? Yeah, no, it's, it's certainly. I mean, these works have just been, I think um, in both of these most recent shows, they really uh, chart a sense of directionality, but they are, you know, it's it's one thing after another, but it's not, um, but it's not sequential, as you're saying. It's not. It, it doesn't introduce a linearity. It's actually a kind of back and forth and return, and 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 the fact that they can be, presumably, could be zipped or unzipped, um, also suggests that they could be organized otherwise, mm -hmm. um, right? Like you could, you know. I'm not suggesting that you will, but but they could be. <laughs> yeah, mm -hmm. I, I did think of that. Um, like maybe the the pieces would change orientation after a certain amount of days, but um, it did take me a while to to decide on the order, and that was kind of my my studio is not even long enough to fit this this one zipper piece at company, um, so I'd kind of have to figure out okay, like what's the order of this going to be. And then it's like, okay, if that becomes the order, what's wrong with this other piece that isn't working? So it was a lot of kind of mixing and um, sewing back into or changing things a little bit to make sure that each each panel kind of could hold its own. Yeah, yeah. And 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 you know, to that point of ordering, um, there is also a disordering in your work, <laughs> um, and and um, a disfiguring. Um, so much of um, so much of what I'm seeing um, in your practice generally and the company show um, is this kind of commitment to an investigation and reinvestigation of disfigurement um, of bodies of materials um, and you know of course this is kind of specific to the medium of collage it's really dependent on this kind of negotiation between assembling and disassembling um, of obscuring and revealing. Um, and I think with your work that kind of takes on um, a heightened uh, significance because you're also very much dealing with, you know, histories and bodies that have been made visible or invisible, um, right? And very much questioning um, what it means to be made invisible um, as a um, um, as a pachuca um, or pachuco. Um, or in your work with, you know, looking at erotic magazines, um, what it means to be made visible or hyper visible for black men um, in that category. Um, so I'm wondering if you could kind of speak about the role that um, revealing and obscuring plays in your practice. Um, how do you decide what to, what to show and what not to show? Um, how do you kind of like make these negotiations between obscuring and revealing? Um, I think that's, I don't know, it's, that's kind of spot on in terms of disruption. So I was thinking a little bit, I did a talk um, for talk art with Russell Tovey and like in the introduction, they're like, you're interested in disruption. But I was like, oh yeah, I am. Um, but that's it's kind of a thread. Sort of in the interest of design. <laughs> yeah, right? I mean, that's from the Ellison, that's why I was like, what? That's from the Ellison quote about the Zoot Suiters, like seeing them as men outside of their own time. but. Um, I think there has always been kind of this interest since early on of, of the type of mass culture that we're receiving through magazines, through television, through media. And I'm not sure why my parents would always tell me at a young age, but they were always like, don't believe everything you see on TV or don't believe everything you read on the paper, which I feel like doesn't really carry on <laughs> to this generation. <laughs> but there's always like a suspicion. Um, but also for me, growing up um, in a predominantly Mexican community and being half black, it felt very hyper visible, but also invisible at the same time. So, so thinking of that predicament 
um, and also not seeing any representation um, thinking about like early 90s right to late 80s really severe huge lack of representation to the point where if I go to the store now and I look at the magazines I'm just shocked because pretty much every cover model is a person of color or an actor um, or a musician and that just feels like there is some type of change happening but then for me it becomes a type of suspicion because it is against this kind of capitalist language right um so that's kind of something i've always kind of been interested in not necessarily disrupting to hurt but sometimes like a just a certain like a small shift can reorient somebody's gaze or make somebody question something um and that's kind of what's important to me um or to kind of give the idea that maybe maybe a like uh, all women zoot suit catalog did exist <laughs> or um, I think in early, early works, I used to do a lot of um, paintings with movie posters, like B-grade horror and sci-fi. So making a, a movie poster appear like it could have been a movie that, that had starred, um, I don't know, whichever various characters. Mm -hmm. But I think at that moment with, the, there was a lot of, working with the with the men's magazines it was tough at first because i didn't know how to go about um cutting into the pages like a lot of people were kind of telling me it was an act of violence but i didn't sense that so i kind of had to keep that's that intuition i was like you have to keep working with this to figure it out and one of my favorite collages which i don't really show it's one of the first called black mamba and it's it's a really beautiful work but it's, it was kind of that moment where I realized that it was important to me to conceal um, the phallus because so much of that, that mag those magazines were about the prowess of the phallus, right? And, and that's, that's what was inciting that particular gaze. Um, so that was kind of one rule I made going forward that I wouldn't um, expose it, which not because I'm a prude, but it just felt like I didn't want to give give the viewer what they wanted to see but somehow in concealing it it almost made it more like erotic mm. in a way <laughs> right it becomes the fig leaf that always yeah. points the thing yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> right yeah so, so salome's unseen dance uh, yeah. but, but i i do want to to say like what an what an honor it is it actually is to like sort of witness you move through your practice and make choices because i i even recognize from like a formal position, how the disruptions that you introduce um, are sometimes very small. Um, and that I, and I, I, you know, I know we are, we will be transitioning to, to questions in just a moment, but I, I maybe it's a nice um, opportunity just to, to end with a, a kind of question around, um, around scale, um, because I think that there is a way in your practice that really big things happen sometimes because of very small moves and then sometimes very small or quiet undertakings are the result of these sort of amplified gestures right and they're um it's one of the things i most admire um it's a this kind of inversion of tools to to get big work done and um i don't know how aware you are of doing that in your practice if that's an intention um or or just um or if you just intuit it <laughs> <laughs> um i mean i guess everything is kind of centered around the the confines of the magazine page mm -hmm. whether it's centerfold or whether it's like the eight and a half by eleven but I, I was working for a very long time, only eight and a half by 11, because there was something really intimate about that scale. It felt one-to-one -one for the viewers if they were looking at a magazine. Um, but, but through research, I was kind of pleasantly surprised to think about weaving and um, kind of this, this paper pulp machine that was utilized for camouflage blankets. Mm -hmm. um, and that's where I was like, whoa, like what if, if, if fabric is a grid already, what if the magazine itself could become a grid? Mm -hmm. um, so that just informed kind of that process. And then thinking of scale, a lot of the scale was determined by um, kind of like advertisement. So still so thinking about poster language, mm -hmm. but also um, I think the series at the Whitney, those were the scale of um, 
a soldier's camouflage blanket um, because one yeah. to one actually yeah because part of the the rationing was was because or the reason why the zootsu was criminalized was blamed for by rationing because Good they needed enough. to conserve wool yeah. sheer yeah. volume yeah mm -hmm. So well, just, sorry, I know you have a, a bit of a time commitment um, or a time crunch. Um, so I suppose we should transition towards question and answers from the audience. Um, unless you have any final thoughts that you'd like to, to add on or to share um, before we close. Um, I'm sure they'll get answered in the questions. <laughs> if people yeah. ask them. Well, I'm just very grateful to have been in conversation and we'll turn it over to the audience yeah no sorry it's so hard to to um to end but yeah let's continue um with our audience uh lynn crawford i'm going to turn it over to you first can unmute him. thank you that was such a bracing conversation you three um energized like I had espresso or something it was brilliant and I was thinking when I saw the title of the show disruptive patterns I'm based in Detroit and a term you hear techno musicians use all the time is the misuse of the machine or the abuse mm. of the machine so of course I was thinking of that and your show title um, together and I'm curious if you have comments or thoughts about that of the disruptive patterning or the well, disruptive patterning, abuse of machine, like this yeah. idea of, um, of intervening in something that actually leads to something beautiful. When sometimes mm -hmm. you hear disrupt or abuse or misuse and it's, yeah. but it leads to something good because what exists isn't what it could be. So to get mm -hmm. to that, you disrupt or abuse or misuse. And I was just curious. Yeah, with the um, disruptive patterning, what I was struck by um, there's this this manual of camouflage written by Roland Penrose called the Home Guard Manual of Camouflage, and so much or it kind of provides maybe like eight ways of successful concealment um, in the early 1940s, like the same same exact time as the zoot suit, but with disruptive coloration or patterning, it's a, a camouflage that is highly visible um, and. Like it kind of, a, I guess that was kind of what informed like razzle dazzle on warships. So you could see, you could see the ship in the distance, but you couldn't tell tell the confines of its shape. There was like a, a formlessness, and for me, I, I equated that to um, kind of the gaze of the zoot suiters, what it what it must have felt like um, for them to kind of be these oddities wearing this kind of flamboyant large baggy suit, but also criminalized because of it. Mm -hmm. um, and then with the other show titles, Rock of I was just perfect. Like, I was like, that's it. Like, that's exactly <laughs> what I'm doing. Um, and with Dishwater Holds No Images, that was from a, a Nina Simone song I heard called Images. And it's a poem by William where I'm wearing CUNY. Um, I think it's just called Images, but it's, it's a really beautiful song. And I think the line that um, for me was heartbreak breaking is um, like um, if she could only see her own beauty, but like the, I can't remember it exactly, but, but dishwater cast no images. Mm. So that's something I felt important with the company show is to really amplify this image of the um, Pachuca. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, I will next turn it over to our friend GE. Can I unmute? Sorry. Thank you so much. Sorry about that. Um, I, I, I before I prefer I ask this question, there was a wonderful song back in the 40s by uh, by the big band K Kaiser's band. And the song was Got My Gal a Zoot Suit for Sunday. And the, it was a wonderful title because it was that ambiguity in the title, which you could read different ways. My mother loved that song. I grew up hearing it. But anyway, um, do you see all your work, your research, even the zipper work, the collages, the canvas, the diagrams, all is kind of like, and here's a pun here, a bit of a seamless garment to kind of negotiate a new kind of firm and passionate consistency? Um. 
maybe not a garment, but I do see it as, as a chapters, kind of like a book. Um, I'm glad you mentioned that song because I, I did listen to that song. It's pretty crazy. That was, yeah. yeah, that was one of the things. But um, yeah, I, I feel like with each body of work, it almost becomes a chapter. So it, it felt really important that this next chapter or maybe final chapter, I'm not sure, really kind of showcase the versatility of the suit. Um, and that's kind of something I was thinking of. But yeah, I'm still kind of maneuvering. It, it's kind of strange for me to be working with, with garments because I don't see myself as a fashion designer. I'm only interested in, in the, the garment as a, a way of collaging or creating collage mm -hmm. or variation. Yeah, I love the way they're embedded in everything, in, in the canvases and things too. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thanks. Thanks, G. Thanks. Yeah, I just wanted to highlight in the chat, um, Raven put in a link to um, a work by Roberto Tejada, who's a poet and art critic, um, which is like a really amazing um, investigation of queerness and the zoot suit. Um, oh, I think cool. it's just an excerpt in that link. But um, uh, so sorry, and then I will turn it over to our very own Bowie. Can go ahead. Thank you. To give our Thank you, Troy. Thank you, Andrea and Zoe. Uh, a true dynamic duo. And congratulations to the show. You know, once, Troy, I remember talking to Zoe Zucker, the artist, Zoe Zucker, about his 100 foot long piece, which he made in 1969. Amazing piece is almost like his created alphabet for what he was going to do throughout his entire life, gradually, one by one. But it's so interesting. Later, I don't remember, I think it might have been in 93, 94, during when Rauschenberg created his own one quarter mile piece, you know, huge. We took him until 98 or so to finish long time before he died, but um, it's 190 something panel, if 190 panel maybe. I saw part of it, of course, in Los Angeles when I was there five years ago. And, but I did remember talking to Zucker, two, two things I'm asking you actually. Um, my question is gonna be a little bit longer than Zoe. That's <laughs> <laughs> long question, right Zoe? <laughs> No, the question is very simple. Um, talking to Zoe Zucker about Rauschenberg, you know, how he came up with the combine. The use of color is not meant to be optical, but a way to construct the work, which is very interesting way of looking at it. In other words, he was born in Port Arthur, Texas. So when he was attending at Black Mountain College, he must have driven back and forth a great deal with Cy Twombly. They both from you know, the South, so as yeah. expert for that matter, uh, Johns. And uh, the point was that they must have, I mean, Rochebert himself must have driven back and forth and saw a lot of African-American self-taught artists, you know, who never threw anything out. If you see a Thornton Dio in the backyard, you know it. Yeah. So my point is that's definitely inherent in their alchemy, for sure. It's not referencing to optical, application of color, like the way that we get taught in school. You went to Yale Graduate School. So, you know, they taught all of that post Albert, Joseph Albert color theory and still today, I'm sure. Uh, so my point, uh, my question is that the sequencing in your collage is very unique. It implies narrative, but also there's something else going on there formally. So were you aware of, of Rauschenberg? hundred, I mean, one quarter mile piece. And yeah, cool. I think, is that the piece called Hiccups? Yeah, you can call Hiccup too. This uh, might okay, I haven't seen this, this really, this other one, but I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that because that's something that I think about often when people were kind of, um, just kind of like, he's like Rauschenberg because of, of course Rauschenberg was privy to all these different artists like Joe Minter, Thornton Dial, um, uh, Ronald Lockett, like 
there's such a, a vast community of artists in the South that have worked in collage. And for me, I've always looked up to them because it's not necessarily about this Western education. It's just an understanding and knowing of the material and using those materials to create a, a gesture, whether it's three-dimensional or two-dimensional. Um, and I, I feel like that that's a way too of working where it has to be intuitive, right? Um, even thinking of like the, the quilting of, of G's bends, like that takes planning, but there's an into like an intuition for color choice. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I think about that in my work often. So there are some formal things that happen in terms of composition where I, I use color as a way to, um, I guess it's still kind of within painting, right? Like foreground, background, middle ground. I use color to kind of help me push things forward and push things back um, similarly with different textures because mm -hmm. There, there's definitely moments of working where everything starts to feel like it's one plane and then I have to go in and either remove or I have to kind of um, change the, the palette a little bit to make the work more complicated. Cool. Well, that's a good answer. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, yes, it's definitely true. Just think of a great Delta Blue master, you know, be it Robert Johnson, Skip James, Napoleon, mm -hmm. and, or whoever else, Bucker White, my favorite. Hello. Yeah. Not to mention Blind Lemon Jefferson. <laughs> Muddy Waters, you know, these are people who influenced the rock and roll, you know, yeah. from the Beatles. So it's very interesting timing that we are reversing the order of chronology mm -hmm. and bear and show more pre greater appreciation, really, you know. Yeah, I think that is implied uh, in the work. So thank you, Troy. Back Thanks. to you, Carolyn. Thank you so much, Fang um, and Troy. Um, so at the rail, we have our tradition of ending our events with a poetry reading. And I'm super excited um, to welcome our poet laureate today, Jalen Strong, to the stage. Jalen Strong is the librarian uh, curator for the Playground Annex and an interdisciplinary artist, musician, and writer. His work has been featured at MoMA PS1, Pratt Institute, the August Wilson House, Brown, MoCA Cleveland, the Center for African American Poetry and Poetics, and elsewhere. And with that, I'll turn it over to you, Jalen. Oh, I'm sorry. I think, yeah. Is, you can all hear me? Cool. All right. Uh, yeah, thank you so much for that introduce, introduction. Um, and really, really a wonderful conversation also to um, be a bystander to and also um, a listener, a participator. Um, really, really wonderful work. And um, I, I'm going to read from the end of my manuscript of a, of a book called Weep Not. Um, that um, garners this title from uh, uh, God or Death Go Down from a, uh, a Johnson poem, uh, which begins, weep not, weep not, she is not dead, um, in reference to um, my sister who, and this is the whole premise of the book, my sister who was unfortunately murdered when I was a child and gets that um, at least I, I, I see the, the resonance between the, the inner child as the maker um, with your work, Troy, and also the weaving is a really, really important part to me. So uh, just the slight context. And I'm going to read this longer refrain lyrical piece that hopefully will be sufficient enough to close up the conversation. Weep not. Yes, retire. Yes, retire. Yes, shadow, scent falling to inextricable pulley, the almost silent rumble of this and that, naming for two arrivals. Look, it seems. Only it has taken but a short degree of time to, yes, retire, retire, 
retire, yes, retire. I, a dangerous assertion this time, have welled enough to be heard. An overwhelming incantation echoes, a melisma, a jubilation, a whole. Look, it seems, I no longer look for what is looking for me. I'm at the congregation of grasses, our feet fibrous, tickling. We are all here. I wish to close my palms and face my fists outward in front of me, extending from my body and hold them out to you like a magic trick. Pick one, I might say, and you point, and I flip my fists, both, no matter your choice. In them, I will a breath and cast it. A gust propulsion. Notice how air is only silent when not moving through us. Here is transmutation concocted. I want not to do away with stitchings of grief. I wish to find a place to be. The anima that glows behind the false nobility of vanishing. Dreaming, a long susurrate, a gust propulsion. Notice how air is only silent when not moving through us. The hustling of long blades of grass, calf's length like a shallow pool, the rising buckle flesh. Oh, what smiles we chant together, dreaming of a place with no name. What if the digging, the rummaging through such lesions forms a passageway? What if our tunnels lead to each other. My friend, there is yet not one being who not knows misery. Even in that, I find a reason to want to hold you close. The regurgitation of a floating alabaster nature has turned us away, dreaming of a place with no name. What if the digging, the rummaging, the making of such an archive the presentation of broken things, the fragments, the desire to alchem al alchemize or the dead into the corner of our ear. Here is my ritual. The grave too is a whole. Weep not, weep not, weep not. I mean to cry, I mean to cry. I mean to cry, my sister is not dead. My nephew is not dead. This is no fantasy. The grounds between imagination and memory, I cannot hold. Scrutinies in this terrible cloak of blood. There, the unmooring floats in flesh's memory. Let me feel said puncture. What if we accept such things? I've learned that even when I lapse behind the tear, we are always right on time. Here lies a breeze just for all of us. The sweet land awaits us. The soil knows it is littered with bones of our loved and our loved and our loved and our loved. Kin with speakable names and those with tongues dormant but soon resurgent. What if we begin digging? Holes, discovering fragments, dispelling the other archives. What if we not only turn the soil, but find where soil is made anew, we take an offering in exchange, in conduit, make things fertile, free. Weep not, and yet I mean to cry, 
to shed, to exude, to drift, to step into one another in the sheer bliss of exiting lonesomeness. Look how we turn and see, dreaming of a prairie with no name, dreaming of a long susurrate, a gust propulsion, Notice how air is only silent when not moving through us. I see with precision, feet cutting through the grass at a calm speed. He runs into her legs, the only thing to stop his movement, the flesh of his mother, a gurgling giggle I can hear, her hands sliding down his back grasping, I can see it. The grass undulates across my legs. I am there. Let me be no fool to even describe the sky. And there is another thing I cannot tell. It is for me to weave open. They are here. I invite you. I invite you. I invite you. There is the boy me, and he smiles and fades. Friends, I invite you. I beckon you to smile. Oh, from where I stand, I see them, hear them in play. They fold into another. I see an amalgam of familiar limbs. I must approach. Thank you. Uh, thank you so, so much, Jalen. That was a really beautiful way to close this out. Um, please, yeah, check the chat um, for some links to more of Jalen's work. Um, and yeah, thank you so much, um, Troy and Zoe and Andrea. Um, and we'd like to thank the Rivers uh, Institute for Contemporary Art and Thought and Cam and company um, for helping to make uh, today's event possible. Um, we encourage everyone to view our archive of these conversations on YouTube, uh, where we will upload today's conversation shortly. And please join us tomorrow at 1 p.m. for a conversation with Jordan Nasser and Dan Cameron. And we will conclude tomorrow with a poetry reading by Elizabeth Robinson. Um, and you can now please uh, turn on your microphone and say goodbye as you all leave. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Beautiful. Thank you, Zoe. Thank you, Andrea. Thank you. Thank you, That was awesome, Jalen. Everything. Beautiful. reading, Jalen. Thank you, Andrea. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Congratulations, Troy. Thank you. I'm reading Lee. Oh, yeah. I love Lee Miller. She was married to Roland Penrose. Right. And it's written by the sun. Who's mm -hmm. a okay. <laughs> so definitely, I don't know if I can fly over to see it at the River Museum, but we certainly can see the show here. Uh, yes. I, I just I'll, I'm, I'm taking this opportunity to share that it, um, Troy Show uh, Rock of I will also travel to Houston in the fall, so uh, oh, I can see it there. Oh, cool. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Will. Congratulations again. Yeah. Thank you for the reading, Jalen. And keep up the good work, you all, because this is exactly what we meant to do, and we're doing it. Bringing our friends together and deploy our greatest commitment to culture and slowness of culture through art and poetry as a means to oppose to Trump usage of speed in technology. Yeah. So we are together. <laughs> And let's go celebrate and have some lunch, shall we? Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you again. Thank you, Thank you, you all. Bye. Bye. Thank you all. Bye. Thank you. Bye, you all. Bye. Bye. Bye.